So welcome back. We now have our third panel and I will directly leave the chair to Ignacio Tirado for the, the organization of it. Ignacio. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, right, so it is um, my, my honor and my pleasure to um, chair the, the, the last of the, of the three panels. Um, one which goes a little bit more into the detail of the uh, of the instruments uh, and touches upon specific matters uh, uh, addressed very well uh, by the um, by both instruments. Actually, this um, is especially topical uh, these days for unfortunate reasons. For the same unfortunate reasons, we can't have all, all our friends here today, uh, which is obviously COVID, which contract has not been affected by COVID and the measures adopted by countries uh, to stave off the risk of uh, to health and to, and to the economy ultimately as well um, due to COVID. Um, naturally, the contracts for the sale of goods, sale of, sale of anything from goods to uh, the companies, which is one of the uh, um, very interesting examples of, of how uh, this has been affected in reality in a hard way, um, have been uh, deeply, severely interfered by the new situation. Um, the uh, the, uh, situa the effect of COVID and COVID-related measures to uh, countries, uh, so to contracts uh, where the completion of the contract uh, doesn't uh, exhaust, exhaust itself in just one act of performance, but it's durable in time, let alone mid to long-term contracts, um, leases, supply contracts, they have all been uh, severely affected, millions of them uh, across the globe, domestically and internationally. So uh, we are, uh, in the world is, in deep need of uh, adequate legal infrastructure to, to deal with this um, terrible situation. And, um, um, it would on its face seem that both instruments that we have on the table here uh, have actually the adequate features and characteristics to be a perfect uh, way to address the um, interference to contractual performance caused by, by COVID and COVID-related measures. They are state-of-the-art, uh, extremely balanced solutions. Uh, they are um, they provide for um, a framework for the renegotiation of certain contracts. Um, they are very flexible, for example, by, by uh, separating force majeure from impossibility of compliance. Um, in other words, they are, ex they are, they are uh, both um, texts and uh, um, are especially apt to preserve value. And value preservation should be um, an objective uh, nowadays, because a very good deal of the contracts that are under threat are actually valuable to the parties and to the economy. And this is uh, the fact that um, the UNIDRA principles for hardship and the and CISG treatment, uh, sorry, for force majeure, uh, are um, an excellent regulation to solve these problems. It's not just the opinion of a conflicted Secretary General, but it's also uh, shown by um, the many countries that have actually adopted these models in their legislation, and um, as we will see in a minute. In order to debate uh, and to discuss um, hardship and force majeure, uh, we count on a starry lineup today. Uh, I'm going to name the panelists uh, um, in the order of intervention. First of all, um, Pilar Perales Vizcasillas, Professor of Law, Chair Professor of Law at uh, um, the Carlos III University in Madrid, um, by no, without any shell of a doubt, the uh, main specialist in the subject in Spain and one of the main sub, uh, specialists in the Spanish speaking worlds. Um, she is a member of the CISG Advisory uh, Council uh, and she has the uh, feature, ad additional feature of having participated both with the CISG teams and with the uh, principles in two of its uh, editions, the last two. Um, so Pilar is uh, first going to take the floor. After her, uh, Benedict Fouracoson is going to speak to us. Um, she's a conseiller d'etat now, but she has been for many years a professor of law at uh, the uh, Paris University, Paris II, Panteon Nassau. And uh, amongst her uh, many, many accolades, 
She was a uh, president of the Société de Legislation Comparée. She's vi vice president of the European Law Institute uh, of the International Academy of uh, Comparative Law, and so on and so forth. And she's going to talk to us um, uh, about the um, French reform in, in uh, relationship to um, the CISG and the principles. Finally, Professor Xi, Xingjia Xi, um, I, I, I forgot to mention incredibly before that, that Benedict is also a member of the Governing Council. Um, uh, Professor Xi, also a member of the Governing Council of, of UNEDRA. She's a Chair Professor of International Business and Economic Law at the Renmin University in China. She was for many years Professor and Dean at the UEB uh, Law School in uh, uh, Beijing, where she hosted us, and we had uh, an excellent uh, series of workshops. And uh, she has, again, like her uh, colleagues of the, in the panel, a thousand uh, accolades and merits that I have not, unfortunately, the time that, uh, to share with all of you because we would just run out of it. So let's crack on. And uh, the first to speak is Pilar. Pilar, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General, uh, for this kind of presentation. Good afternoon from Madrid. As it uh, has just been mentioned by the Secretary General, the topic that I'm in charge of, force major and hardship in the regulation of London. Pilar, no te podemos ver. No sé si tienes apagado el video. Sí, pero I, I have a video on. You have it on? Yeah, I do. We can't see you. No? No, no, let me see. No. No, you, you're black. I mean, you just see a black image. <laughs> uh, I don't know why, because it's uh, supposed to work. I, it has been working uh, every time that I use Zoom. Well, uh, we, can, we can hear you very well, though. So if you want to go on, perhaps it's a shame. Yeah, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very sorry for that. Uh, may I then proceed then? Yes, yes, of course. Let's okay. go on. Sorry, uh, well, I was saying that, uh, as you mentioned before, uh, this topic is, uh, is indeed the fashion theme in many conferences around the world since the COVID pandemic began some months ago. So no wonder because of the severe impact of the outbreak of the pandemic and its consequences in the performance of international commercial contracts and the economic crisis associated to this. The, this impact of the pandemic is more profound in long-term contracts because by definition, and this is the definition um, used in Article 111 of the UNIDRA principles, refers to contracts which are to be performed over a period of time, as opposed to contracts to be performed at one time, such as ordinary exchange, con exchange contracts. The classical example is the sale of goods contracts, which was a model that the original drafters of the UNIDRA had in mind following precisely the Vienna Convention, the CIG mod model. Not because we're becoming more and more familiar, uh, familiar with these institutions and particularly with that of hardship, still unregulated in many domestic legal systems. One might conclude on a normal recognition of hardship as a common or regular institution to be applied over the principle of panta, pacta sunt servanda. But on the contrary, Hardship should be allowed only in exceptional cases in order to restore the equilibrium of the contract and so the validation of the terms of the contract originally agreed by the parties should not be easily disregarded. No other institutions or group can claim more legitimacy than UNIDRAT and UNCITRAL to precisely present this topic in a conference. And so I'm very grateful for having the opportunity to give some thoughts to such a distinguished audience and in this panel chaired by the Secretary General of UNIDRA and dear university co colleague, Professor Ignacio Tirado, together with my co-panelist. UNIDRA, that is uh, well known, was the first institution to deal internationally with hardship in the first edition of the UNIDRA principles in 1994 and with long-term contrast in general in the most res recent fourth edition of 2016. Of a great interest is the recent uh, published note of the UNIDRA Secretariat on the UNIDRA principles and the COVID-19 health crisis that although is not meant to express an official position, position of UNIDRA on the use or, or interpretation of the UNIDRA principles, and therefore it constitutes merely a document for public discussion, offers, in my opinion, a flexible and practical guidance to contracting parties on this area. 
the uh, uniform international regime achieved by UNIDRA is certainly one of the most selling feature features embracing with an autonomous regime and an international language different from domestic institutions that are therefore displaced when uh, the UNIDRA principles were to govern a given country. The same, of course, would apply for the CIG. The uh, differences uh, within domestic legal systems is a reality, at least if we refer to the change of economic uh, circumstances, hardship, where a diversity of solutions is found in domestic and international regulations in contrast with force majeure, since force majeure excuse may be characterized as a truly transnational legal principle or as part of the new Lex Mercatoria, as rightly, uh, by the way, pointed out in a recent article by professors Berger and Ben. In fact, um, Article 79 and soon after Article 7.1.7 of the UNIDRA principles were the models followed in other domestic legislations and international soft law instruments in regard to the first major provision. Those are in that line of, uh, of the classical first major uh, provisions that we find in domestic uh, law, but with a unique um, um, angle or point of view towards the internationality of uh, the contract. And therefore those uh, provisions ought to be interpreted autonomously and particularly so in relation with the term impediment, which is the key notion within the principles and um, the CIG. Um, the difference between the type of problem caused by uh, COVID-19 and the institutions of force major and hardship has more to do with the result than with the reasons that causes uh, it. Since UNIDRAD opted for a dual treatment of both, the differences do not lie in the kind of events that might trigger, trigger one or the other, but on the remedies. Different policy reasons lie behind the different options that are at the level of the effects and remedies, as I have just mentioned. Um, and for this, we find uh, in an international comparison two different models. Either uh, we find a model in which there is express regulation of force major and silence about hardship. That is clearly the model uh, followed within the Vienna Convention, the CRG, as well as we find it in the OHADA Uniform Act on General Commercial Law. So then under this uh, test, the issue is how to achieve a solution to fill this gap, if this can be called a gap, which is not uh, so clear. Despite the fact that many possible solutions are offered by scholars on case law, including the application of the UNIDRA principles to fill the gaps within the convention, within the CIG, the trend, uh, I think, however, nowadays is to consider a unitary approach under Article 79 CIG to both institutions, to both force major and harsh. This is particularly so in the uh, publication of two opinions of the Advisory Council on the Vienna Convention, opinion number seven on Article 79, by the way, adopted in Wuhan in 2007, and opinion uh, number 20 on hardship, very recently published in July. So it's very, very brand new opinion precisely on this, uh, on this topic of uh, hardship. Uh, in, in accordance with opinion number 20 of the CSG Advisory Council, hardship is not conceived as an internal gap, but embodied within the concept of impediment. And thus, the solution is the straightforward application of Article 79, with no obligation for the parties to renegotiate the contract and no resort to a court or arbitral tribunal to terminate or amend the contract. And this is so because neither of them can be found within Article 79 or elsewhere in the Convention. The policy view is not to allow interferences um, from third parties, from the court or, or an, an arbitral tribunal and, uh, within the contract and the uh, inexistence of a duty to renegotiate that cannot be derived from the CIG, neither expressly nor by implication of the general principle. To this regard, it has to be noted that this solution is not because the CIGAC has concluded that no duty of good faith exists under the Convention, but that the principle of good faith in itself cannot be deemed to provide a solid basis for a duty to renegotiate or a right to terminate or amend a contract, neither unilaterally nor by a third party. 
And to this, it is, it is to be noted that there are legal uncertainties uh, regarding the scope of those obligations. Then, as opposed to the treatment within the CIG and what I consider to be now the majority um, opinion, at least uh, <laughs> under the eyes, uh, eyes um, of the CIG advisory council, we find the dual treatment of both institutions in which the UNIDRA principles has been the model that uh, has been followed by several other international regional instruments like the principles of European contract law, the DCFR, the OHADAC uh, principles, and the Latin American principles. It's also a tendency that we see uh, nowadays also in some domestic uh, reforms or legislation, but sure other co-panelists would speak about this. Basically, a uh, renegotiation period is foreseen, whether mandatory or not, and then depending on the regulation, either a resort to a court or arbitrary tribunal that might terminate or adapt the contract such in the case of the UNIDRAT uh, principles, or a direct termination of the contract by one, by one of the parties, as, it, as in one of the ICC options. As you know, the ICC has also, since a long time ago, provided for the parties to optional clauses to be included into the contract, and for that they provide a clause, uh, a mother clause for, for source major, and another one for uh, hardship. Um, in the case of the hardship model clause, it's interesting because a simple reading of the regulations that um, are embodied within the, the ICC, there, there are three options uh, for the parties, uh, implies that uh, the solutions are by far to be considered to be in, in unanimous uh, within uh, the international regulation. Um, for me, uh, we see all this uh, pure view of what is going on in other international uh, instruments. Uh, for me, it's enough to show that the remedies in the case of hardship does not enjoy a uniform international recognition, which means that we are not in the presence of a usage of trade, a transnational principle, or similar expressions as those established in the uh, preamble of the UNIDRA principle. Um, common, um, despite this, the uh, differences in all those instruments, common to all solutions is indeed the recognition of the principle of freedom of contract and particularly the distribution of risk between the parties that might deem unnecessary to resort to international or domestic regulations. Therefore, when a first major clause or a hardship clause is agreed in the contract, it prevails over the provisions of the otherwise applicable rules. Whether this means a total or a partial exclusion depends on the way the clause is drafted. Normal issues of contract interpretation would arise, and certainly the rules on contract interpretation on the applicable rules of law would not be affected by the existence of a first major or hardship clause within the contract. The allocation of risk of changing circumstances is the central point of any doctrine on the revision of uh, contracts. Being uh, clear that uh, no implicit rebus clause exists in long-term contract, it is up to the parties to distribute the risk between them. For example, through clauses or mechanisms, mechanisms of modification, revision or alteration of the price of the contract, the so-called, for example, escalation clauses, common in certain sectors such as gas supply contracts which are sufficient, sufficiently detailed for the uh, parties and then later on for the arbitrators uh, to uh, feel, uh, to modify or to adjust uh, the contract. Otherwise, absent such a kind of tools within the contract, the court or arbitrators will not in principle easily adjust the contract unless the combined effect of the long duration of the contract, complexity of the transaction, and the kind of ongoing relationship between the parties, and I take note that this is coming from the uh, more longer definition of what is considered to be a long-term contract under the unit drug principles, all of this combination might conduct the uh, third parties to infer from the contract and for um, the principle of good faith a possible modification or adjustment of the contract. Therefore, the best advice is that the parties design the speci specific provisions to deal with force major and hardship situations, even subject to a general duty to best afford uh, provision in order to solve 
the future issues that might arise during the performance of the, con of the contract. This duty of best effort, need needless to say, is, is equ equivalent to the duty to negotiate in good faith that is found within the UNIGRA principles. As a conclusion, Secretary General, the brief analysis done, which is very ab abstract indeed, leads to the conclusion that we are in an uncertain world in legal terms, with different legal sensitivities to supervening events that affects the performance of long-term contracts. However, whatever the analysis is, it cannot dispense with the interpretation of the contract, the scope that must be given in the specific case to the principal pacta sunt servanda, and the risk contractually or impliedly assumed by the parties. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you very much, Muchas gracias, Pilar, for the excellent overview. It was very comprehensive, and I'm sure will uh, generate a lot of questions more concrete uh, uh, following the abstract analysis. So the floor is uh, Benedict's. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ignacio. Um, I'm really pleased to well, be here today. Um, I will try to be uh, short and don't hesitate to cut me if I'm too long. Um, I will first give a brief introduction. Uh, second, I will say what were the driving forces behind the French contract law reform. And third, I will engage into a small comparison of some provisions with the UNIDRA principles. Needless to say, to start, that both the CISG and the UNIDRA principle have had a considerable impact on contract law throughout the world. In fact, I think that no contract law lawyer can afford to ignore them today. And this is true for judges, for practitioners, for academics, for legislators. Uh, besides, one striking feature of the UNIDRA principles is that they have contributed to the development of private law beyond the state, of soft law beyond international conventions. And the fact that the CISG and the UNIBRA principles formulate the best solutions for international commercial contracts could have raised one question. Um, should they really serve as models for national reforms since uh, it's not for international contracts, but national contracts? And in fact, we realized that the differences are not so great and that these instruments that had been conceived for the needs of international commercial contracts were very appropriate also when it comes to reforming one's uh, own legal system. I will concentrate on the influence of the UNIDRA principles on French law for two reasons. Um, because the UNIDRA principles have themselves been influenced by the CIA SG, and also uh, because the CISG is limited to the law of sales. Therefore, it was less obvious for the French legislator to take into account the CISG into a reform which only concerns general contract law. We have the intention to reform specific contracts further on, but this has not been done yet, and sales law will be a candidate for reform. Um, the next reform will be tort law, probably next year. And since we had um, a very good uh, contribution on limitation of action prescription, I want to say that we have also reformed our law of prescription in 2007. And this law was very much inspired by the UNIDRA principles too. So the general context in Europe and also the international context have prompted the French contract law reform they have paved the way for some evolutions of the Code Civil. It is important that you have in mind that uh, our black letter rules dated from 1804 and um, that we had not changed them in the civil code, but of course, through case law, through statutory law, through other codes, French contract law had already evolved. So there was a real question of making the law more attractive as Stefan Wogener rightly said this morning, um, at the beginning of the afternoon, and also making it more modern and up to date. Um, the reform took place at the Ministry of Justice. It was done by judges, but in fact, uh, many stakeholders took part in this reform. French academics, 
and I was uh, fortunate uh, enough to be part-time at the Ministry of Justice and also a member of the group of UNIDRA principles on commercial contract at that time. And the um, academics were also working with legal professions. So I must say that for more than 15 years, there has been a lot of dialogues in order to try to take into account uh, all these different views. Um, a very important source of inspiration has been the work of a French group which was commissioned within the European network um, for the draft common frame of reference and which drafted some principles, guiding principles, which have been inserted into the new civil code and which uh, found the three pillars of freedom, security and contractual fairness. I've heard several times today that um, contractual freedom was very important and that it was bringing uh, security. And I agree with this vision. But um, good faith is also very important. And it's also very important in the UNIDRA principles. And we always have to strike the right balance. And one of the main questions that uh, always came to the forefront when we were reforming French contract law was where to put um, the good balance between good faith, contractual freedom, and fairness. And in fact, it rests in the power of the judge. And we heard Stefan Vogenara, who told us that the French contract law reform was perhaps not that attractive because um, it was uh, inserting new provisions on hardship and also it has also new provisions which give the judge the power to strike an unfair term. But I want to insist on the fact that this power is only granted when you have standard form contracts for standard terms. While in some other codifications, and I think in the UNIDRA principles, the judge may have this power if there is a gross disparity, even if the contract was negotiated. So I believe that the French contract law reform, but perhaps you will think that I'm biased, but that it has managed to strike a good balance between all these important principles. And I come to my second point, the driving forces behind this reform. It was, as you have understood, the European context and the international context. And at that time, we were not sure whether or not we would have a um, European Code Civil, or at least a common frame of reference. And I must say that this has very much um, incited the French uh, legislature to work on its own reform. Uh, perhaps it's a bad incentive, but that was an incentive. But also, there were some um, needs to do this reform, because in 1804, the rules on contract law were inspired by the ideas of individualism and liberalism. In fact, they reflected the Enlightenment, the newly gained um, freedom and equality. While in the 19th century, liberalism grew all over Europe. And then over the 20th century, freedom of contract was restricted. But it was restricted mainly in those areas where statutory protection was to be given to one party because it's weak. For instance, an employee, for instance, a tenant, for instance, a consumer. So protection was required from the outset. And um, this was done through mandatory provisions to grant those parties rights that are non-negotiable or public de protection. That was in the 20th century. 200 years after the Code Civil, uh, a better equilibrium had to be found to take this into account and to take into account the fact that the European Union has adopted a great many directives with the result that some issues of contract law, particularly in the field of consumer law, are treated uniformly now across all member states. And although in France, consumer law is dealt with in a separate code, the Code de la Consommation, it had an influence on the reform, on general contract law, particularly for the duty of information or, again, for unfair terms. But I want to reassure you, the driving force behind this reform still is contractual uh, freedom. 
And there is a wide accept acceptance that the principles of freedom of contract prevails and that the majority of the new rules are suppletive, which means dispositive, they're not mandatory rules. So the parties can put aside the framework that has been uh, set forth. And also, again, I want to insist on the fact that this balance was found by looking at the Unidra principles, by looking also at the balance found in PECL uh, between freedom and contractual fairness. My third point, um, and it will be a little longer than the two previous ones, um, is about comparisons between the Unidra principles and some provisions of the French contract law reform. I will not be able to account for all the major changes. Um, if you want to know more about it, I advise you to read the report to the President of the Republic because the reform was made by decree, by an ordinance, which was further adopted by the legislature. This is why it was made in two steps, first in 2016, second in 2018 when it was ratified in a law by the Parliament. And the report to the President, which was published in 2016, together with the ordinance, um, is very illuminating um, in respect of the various influences. And it well shows how the UNIDRA principles have influenced the um, uh, different commissions that have worked on this French reform. Firstly, you will notice that contrary to the previous Code Civil, we now have new introductory provisions which set forth the principle of freedom of contract, which set forth the binding character of contract and also good faith. We also have new provisions and here I think it's really an influence of the CISG as well as of the UNIDRA principle on the pre-contractual period. And um, we have a section on the validity of contract, a bit like chapter three of the UNIDRA principles on validity. And this section begins by a new article 1128, which says that consent, capacity, and a content that is lawful and certain are necessary for a contract to be valid. Consent, capacity, lawful and certain content. For those who know French contract law, you will immediately see what is missing. The cause is missing. There has been a great debate in France when the government decided to abolish the cause because la cause causa is one of the distinguishing features of French contract law, but not, also, not only of French contract law, of the civil law countries. And it was often said that if France was to abandon the cause, many countries which had the cause would be a bit perplexed. And I know that there has been some perplexity, but here I must say that the influence of unity war was very, very important. And finally, the legislature, against most academics, decided that the concept of cause, which in fact was a bit um, difficult to understand even for French lawyers, because it had a double meaning. Uh, it concerned both liceity, illegality, and also the content of the contract. So it was a bit uh, tricky. So the concept of cause has disappeared. Um, we have now the notion of content of contract, which you find everywhere in the UNIDRA principles and also in PECL. So you see here the influence. Many provisions of the civil code relate to the consent because traditionally in France, the theory of defects of consent is very important mistake, fraud, duress. Um, a specificity of French law is that avoidance or nullity is a remedy which must be claimed before the courts. You don't have the capacity to send a notice saying that you're going to avoid the contract because you consider that you've been the victim of an error. So that is one specificity which, much to my regret, has been kept. And this is where uh, we are not exactly in line with UNIDRA principles. In the UNIDRA principle, gross disparity is a ground for avoidance under certain circumstances. And following this inspiration, we have introduced a rule in the Code Civil, 
which um, also has um, the possibility to avoid the contract in case of economic duress. But the most important rule, highly controversial, was one about unfair terms. Initially, the reform um, intended to enable the judge to strike out an unfair term in any contract, be it a standard firm contract or a negotiated contract. There were so much oppositions from the professions and also from some academics that this initial uh, project was abandoned and that finally the power for judge, the judicial power to strike out an unfair term was limited to standard form contracts, which we call contrat d'adhésion. So you will notice that in this respect, the judge has less power than the one which is granted to him or to her by the unit work principles, which enable for the striking out of an unfair term, um, even though the contract has been negotiated. Um, another interesting thing is that the distinction uh, between two kinds of obligation, obligation de moyens and obligation de résultat, um, has been introduced in the unit work principles, duty to achieve a specific result and duty of best efforts in article 514, for example, and you find it again in other articles. And it has not been codified by the Code Civil. It originates from academics, it has been used by um, case law and it is still used by case law, but the legis French legislator didn't want to codify it. Um, we have new provisions on the determination of price, which draw some inspiration from French case law, as well as from UNIDWA principles, but they have their specificity. I will not go into the detail because I don't want to be too long. We have a new provision on the quality of the act of performance. We had no such thing in the Code Civil, and this is indeed inspired by the Vienna Convention and by the UNEDRA principles, as well as Becker. Um, we also have um, provisions on interpretation of contract, which draw inspiration from these models. Um, we have kept the subjective interpretation of contract, which is a landmark uh, for from civil law countries, but then we add that where the common intention of the parties cannot be discerned, a contract is to be interpreted in the sense which a reasonable person placed in the same situation would give to it. And here you see the entrance of some form of objective interpretation. Um, I won't say much of the text on change of circumstances, except that it's really a novelty in French law. Uh, we had uh, a rule which stemmed from case law, um, according to which it was not possible to take into account a change of circumstances. And this new provision, which is in Article 1195 of the Code Civil, draws a lot of inspiration from the UNIDRA principles, although it also has its specificity, and it insists very much on the obligation of the parties to renegotiate before giving the judge the power to either revise or terminate the contract if one party does not want to renegotiate. And we have provisions on non-performance, which are very much inspired also by international models, by the CISG and UNIDRA principles. Um, some uh, differences remain, um, but um, globally, uh, we can see that there was the willingness of the French legislator to insist on the fact that we must give the power to the party to terminate unilaterally the contract. For avoidance, it's not possible. For termination, we followed the international models and it's no longer necessary to go to the judge. One party, particularly in case of a fundamental breach, can unilaterally decide to terminate the contract, even though there was no termination clause um, to this effect. Uh, I will stop here. Um, I just drew a few um, points and as a conclusion, I want to share with you one thought, which is that in the 19th century, national codifications were really instruments to um, make oneself very proud of one uh, national legal system, 
and also instruments to differentiate the legal systems. Because once you had a modern code, you would follow this code and only this code. While today, national codifications or recodifications are the cement of European private law and of internationalization of the law, because they are themselves inspired by international instruments. And the common language is thus taking shape, not only in international instruments, but also in those national codifications. And in this respect, I think that um, the work of UNIDRA has been great. And now the legal guide does a wonderful job also in explaining how international and soft law instruments work together and the limits also of the party's choice of one national law uh, rather than another one and the limits of party autonomy um, through the white police. So all this is fascinating and I think that we've been very lucky to share um, these experiences and adventures over the last 20 years uh, together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benedict, for this general, um, for those uh, very th uh, deep and thorough reflections and this general overview of the French reform to, with relation to the ancestral uh, CISG and especially to our principles. Um, I am sure there will be many questions following your intervention and perhaps even uh, Stefan might want to say something about this uh, direct uh, uh, reference. Uh, however, let's move on to um, uh, Pr Professor Xi's uh, presentation. Over to you, uh, Josie. Many thanks for your kind introduction, Mr. Secretary General, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. I'm tremendously honored to attend this conference, even it is a virtual one. I echo my co-panelists uh, uh, seeing that the CSG and the UPIC have a great impact on domestic uh, legislation worldwide. So naturally, I'm very happy to share with you uh, several thoughts on the impact of the CSG and the UPIC on China's new civil code, mainly from the perspective of contract law, particularly uh, sales contract. I will briefly uh, touch upon three aspects. First, a general background on the code and its part on contract. Second, how the CSG and the UPIC generate impact on this code. And the third, more uh, specific examples on the interaction between uh, Chinese contract law and uh, international instruments, particularly uh, from uh, the CSG and the UPIC. So the uh, first part of my uh, talk, um, I'd like to give you a brief introduction of uh, China's new civil code and its part on contract. Uh, the National uh, People's Congress of China adopted the, the Civil Code on May 28th, uh, 2020, this year, which uh, the code will uh, enter into force January 1st, 2021, next year. A codification of private laws that regulate property uh, and personal rights the civil code is quite important for uh, several reasons in China. First, the code is uh, China's first statute styled, styled as a code. Second, the code uh, tries to reduce the inconsistencies between uh, or among the standalone civil, uh, many civil statutes enacted over the past several decades and also uh, cites some um, of the uh, novel or new legal issues that have uh, uh, since arisen. So when the civil code becomes effective, uh, many standalone statutes, including contract law, uh, will be uh, simultaneously repealed. Uh, third, to the general public uh, in, in China, it affects their daily life in the most uh, uh, direct and intimate uh, manner. Finally, the code also symbolized that China's social, um, uh, economic, and legal institutions 
uh, have become suffi sufficiently uh, sophisticated uh, and made it uh, feasible for China to enact a civil code embracing both uh, unique Chinese values uh, and the international experience. Uh, a massive piece of legislation, this code include, includes 1,260 articles divided into seven parts, uh, including general part, uh, part on rights in RAM, part on contract, part on personality rights, part on marriage and the family, part on inheritance, and the finally part on uh, tort liability. The part on contracts is the longest one among the code's seven parts. It has 29 uh, chapters in total, uh, which are divided into three uh, subparts uh, that are general provisions, typical contracts, uh, including 18 kinds of contracts, including a sales contract and the so-called quasi or quasi uh, contracts as well. Uh, so in my uh, second part of the talk, um, I summarize a, an indirect impact of CSG and the UPIC on the civil code. Uh, basically, when it comes to the impact of CSG and the UPIC on China's new civil code, my basic observation is that uh, during the process of making this civil code in the past several years, uh, the drafters, there are many drafters there, uh, may not directly look at or borrow uh, from the provisions uh, uh, from the CSG and the UPIC. But this does not mean that these international instruments have no impact or influence on the code. Instead, the impact is reflected in an indirect way. What does that mean? In my opinion, to a large extent, the making of Chinese civil code is a process of codifying uh, many, uh, you know, uh, already existing statutes regulating uh, private property and the rights. Uh, of course, with some new uh, provisions reflecting uh, new developments, such as the e-commerce, uh, and also incorporating uh, Chinese practice as well. So taking the part on contract as an example, uh, this part uh, contains 526 articles and is mainly based on the contract law, which was enacted in 19. 99 uh, and uh, uh, contains 428 articles. So the chapter on sales contract is not an uh, exception in this situation. By saying that, I mean, uh, this part is also mainly based on the, the chapter of sales contract in 1999 contract law. That contract law is the first uniform contract law in China, which has played very important role in Chinese um, uh, economic development. Uh, so in general, the contract law is held a big success because it not only unified the fragmentary uh, contract law regime previously existing in China, but also substantively modernized that regime uh, of contract. What an achievement this is may be illustrated by the fact that the contract law for the first time uh, explicitly recognize the basic principles of modern or uh, Western contract law, such as the principles of contractual freedom uh, and good faith and et cetera. So as, as a matter of fact, the development of Chinese contract law now codified into the civil code could not have been achieved if Chinese legislators or drafter, drafters had ignored the guiding uh, value of the CSG and the UPIC. In this respect, there is a, a so-called notion of uh, uh, double transplanta uh, transplantation. Uh, 
uh, which means you know the adopt first the adoption of the CSG as China's uh, international sales law, and then China reuse uh, of the reuse the CISG as a as a major source in drafting its own contract law. That being said, it's not hard for us to understand uh, that the civil code is indeed greatly affected by such international instruments as the CSG and the UPIC. And also because of this, the part on contracts has not been particularly uh, controversial in making the civil code, since the set of this set of advanced rules are not supposed to be changed too much. Uh, so, in my last part of the talk, uh, I'd like to uh, give you some example about the interaction uh, between China's sales law and the CSG and the UPIC. Uh, as you probably may know, China was a uh, 10th signatory state uh, to the CSG. And the convention became effective in China on January 1st, 1988. Uh, during the past over three decades, the CSG has had a phenomenal impact in China, proof of which is twofold. First, the CSG has greatly influenced the, the evolution of Chinese domestic contract law. During the drafting of the contract law, the CSG was one of the most important sources of reference. Uh, the formal, uh, formation of a contract performance, uh, compensation for losses pursuant to the G uh, CSG are all identical with the provisions of uh, domestic Chinese uh, contract law. Hence, there is no uh, fundamental uh, conflict between a, uh, an application of the law uh, uh, of the CSG compared with uh, domestic contract law on this uh, issues. Furthermore, the drafters of the law have consulted and uh, absorbed the rules of CISG on like uh, offer and acceptance, avoidance, termination of the contract, liabilities for breach of a contract, interpretation of a contract, uh, uh, and etc. So the CISG's impact on Chinese contract law are not uh, limited to sales specific uh, topics. It has uh, had an impact on non sale uh, specific issues as well. Second, with China's uh, active participation in international uh, trade in the past uh, several decades, more and more uh, Chinese cases have been uh, decided under the CISG. Uh, some of them you can look up from the Unilex the database. In many reported cases, the outcomes actually suggest that the CISG, uh, had it been applied, would not have changed the result uh, at all. You know, the, the cases were heard by, uh, by Chinese court. For the UPIC, it is also widely uh, recognized that the principles have successfully established a persuasive authority uh, in the field of international contract law over the years and have ex uh, exerted considerable influence on an impressive number of legislative reform uh, of Chinese contract law. Uh, so in China's case, the UPIC not only provides China with a window to observe the development of contract laws worldwide, but they, they are also a shortcut to link the uh, domestic uh, Chinese law with international standards. In fact, Chinese uh, legislators were greatly inspired by the UPIC that represent a modernization of contract law. And the contract law is thus de deemed a convincing example that the UPIC has, uh, uh, have served as a useful model for uh, Chinese domestic legislature. The drafters of the contract law not only widely uh, 
uh, consulted the uh, UPICC, but they are they also transplanted various provisions from them. Uh, in addition, uh, Chinese contract law and the UPIC are quite similar or even identical in various uh, respects, such as the provisions, uh, I mean, from the UPIC, such as the provisions on validity of a, of a contract, which, you know, CISG has no uh, no provisions. Uh, Professor Liang Huixing, a leading uh, contract law uh, expert in China, has clearly expressed uh, the drafters' preference and the rely, reliance on on the UPIC. Uh, quoting his words, the Unidraft principles reflected the uh, consensus of authoritative scholars of both common law and the civil law traditions and represents the general trend uh, of the development of a contract law. The reference to the uh, UPIC has also been positively echoed by Chinese lawmakers and academics. For instance, Professor Zhang Yuqing, former head of the Department of Treaty and Law uh, at the Chinese uh, Ministry of Commerce, also a former member uh, of UNIDRA Governing Council, uh, when commenting on contri uh, contribution of the uh, UPIC in drafting uh, Chinese contract law. Uh, he said that the broad scope of the application of the UNIDRAP principles has no doubt had an impact on Chinese domestic uh, contract law. Moreover, like the CSG, the UPIC are also clearly recognized by some Chinese courts and have been considered or even applied by courts not only as mere uh, references uh, and the background law, but also as effective uh, uh, applicable law, absent parties' uh, explicit choice, notwithstanding China's strict uh, conflict of law rules. Um, Last point, despite the, uh, the above interaction, uh, I'd also uh, like to point out that China, of course, has not adopted the CSD or UPIC in a wholesale way. Uh, some provisions uh, currently you know, in, in, uh, in the civil code uh, still possess uh, strong uh, Chinese characteristics. Some are quite different from uh, from their counterparts in in the uh, UPIC or even CSG, and some uh, do not have their counterparts in in the CSG or UPIC. Uh, many such unique provisions for mainly focus on you know the contracts the subjects to uh, the approval or, or registration by. Uh, uh, public authorities, specific types of contract, subrogation uh, and the contracts concluded and a state mandatory plan or state purchase order, you know, in the last version of uh, Chinese uh, civil code, because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, this kind of provision, you know, uh, be, seems becoming also important, even in the current uh, civil code of China. So uh, with on ongoing development of the market economy uh, and also uh, China's in uh, more in much integration into the world economy, I believe that an increasing number of uh, uh, advanced or updated provisions in uh, particularly in, in the UPIC will be absorbed uh, into Chinese contract law, uh, either through legislative process, uh, such as uh, civil code, or uh, by uh, through judicial practice developed by, you know, uh, particularly by Supreme Court of China uh, as well in the future. So I will stop here. Uh, I'd like to um, answer questions you may have. Thank you so much for your listening, uh, for your time. And I hope all, all of you stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much for, again, another excellent presentation. Um, Right. Um, consistently, all three participants have been great, and consistently, all three participants have almost doubled the time that they said they would speak. Uh, but that's okay. I think we have time for uh, some debate. Um, 
we can now see Pilar, so she's there. Uh, we've, we've recovered her. Um, I think, um, first of all, for the questions, we have a few. Um, I would ask the uh, panelists to respond, please, concerning uh, hardship and, and uh, force majeure and everything that's related to that, not, not generally on their uh, changes of the legal system, but to focus perhaps on the specific items of the chair of the um, panel. Uh, but I would like to start uh, using the privilege of the chair um, of the panel um, to pick up from the beginning this um, interaction between um, or uh, the French professor's um, tease by the German professor's remarks, which is something that happens uh, often and is nice and the other way around as well. Uh, and perhaps Stefan might want to make a comment because hardship and change of circumstances and, and clauses that exclude uh, uh, um, the possibility of, of judges revising, uh, um, it goes directly to the heart of, uh, of, uh, of course, private autonomy and to the applicability of the principles. And I think it's a debate which is most uh, important concerning the application of, of these instruments. So, Stefan, would you like to perhaps say something? Let's wait until the, <laughs> the camera points at you. Uh, just in, in between, allow me just, uh, there are a couple of questions unanswered from the first session. I am afraid, um, and, and, and we are back. I'm not sure we can uh, answer them in this session, but we will make sure that the, the persons who've sent them get a proper reply, even perhaps separately and in private. Yes, uh, thank you um, for giving me the opportunity, perhaps to clarifying what I said earlier. Uh, um, Benedict Fouracosson just uh, uh, took up the, the comment I made about the reform of French contract law. And um, this was not meant in any way to, to criticize the quality of the rules. I actually think particularly the uh, rule on imprévision is a, is a very good compromise. And, and as it was said, is, is based closely on the very good rules in uh, chapter six point or section 6.2 of the Unidraw principles. Uh, but of course, in this area, as, as the research shows, uh, what matters often is not so much the quality of the rules, but the perception of the quality. And I think if you ask uh, businesses, what makes an attractive contract law for you? The reply that you often get is, oh, I want um, clarity, I want predictability, and I want sanctity of contract. I, I want contracts to be binding. And there is, of course, often a very naive understanding that once you negotiate the contract and it's set in stone, then everything will be fine. Uh, of course, that's not the case. But uh, when parties choose the applicable contract law, that's normally when they make the contract, obviously, you can have ex post choices of law as well. And at that stage, there is this belief, ah, now we've negotiated everything and we want the judge in the future just stick to the letter of this contract. You find the same debate if you, if you think about um, supplementary interpretation of contracts. If you ask parties at the time of making of the contract, do you want to have that? They would always say, no, no way, because we've negotiated such a beautiful contract. Once there is an issue later on, of course, one of the parties will always argue that they want to be released from their obligations because there was some hardship or there was a gap in the contract or something like this. So I, th I think, in a way, if the French legislator had been only concerned about making the new contract law attractive to international business parties, they would have gone more closely with the English model and uh, put a stronger emphasis on the sanctity of contract. The reason that the French legislator hasn't done that is totally comprehensible because it's a droit commun, which doesn't only look at commercial contracts, but has to keep the entire private law uh, 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 in perspective. And this means that the legislator also has to balance out different interests. And this is why I think actually the rules are pretty good. It's not just that if you were to design a contract law from scratch, uh, that instinctively appeals to international businesses that these rules would have been high on the list of priorities. And Benedict mentioned um, 
the criticism that had been um, uh, leveled against the first drafts. And I remember vividly, um, I think we both attended a conference uh, by the um, Chamber of Commerce in Paris, where one speaker after the other uh, uh, criticized the first draft because this idea that now all of a sudden there would be a policing of the substance of contract terms was regarded as an outrageous um, uh, attack on private autonomy. Thank you. Uh, right. I, I don't know, if, uh, Benedict, if you want to say something. If, if you do, keep it brief. Would you like to? Uh, I will. Well, that was very, very clear. Thank you, Stefan, for this um, comment. And I entirely agree um, with what you've just said. Uh, and I, I do think that uh, um, it's a good thing that the draft have evolved and that the French legislator has uh, heard all the criticism that had been made initially. Um, that's it. Thanks. I've always wondered uh, what would happen if the parties ex ante decided to include a clause, one of those famous hell or high water clauses in certain areas where um, the parties are very um, sophisticated and there's no uh, lack of bargaining power. And they decided ex ante that anything that happens, the right will be allocated for X or Y. And uh, they make it clear that in any circumstance, um, I, I do not see how um, that would be all overruled by a rule which incorporates the hardship uh, Rule is is it's just a way to allocate the uh, the rights for the parties to to renegotiate in case there is value and if there's no value there's no need to renegotiate, isn't it? I mean it's just uh, um, to start the the rules of the game. Anyway, uh, so point I was trying to make is I don't see how these rules could scare off the business world because it, this doesn't mean you're opening up for any reform, but. Uh, the parties can choose not to. Uh, the, uh, a first uh, question came for Pilar. Um, uh, Mr. or Miss, I don't know, Lorfing um, does not agree. Um, I will not read this um, uh, literally. It does not agree uh, that um, um, the hardship provided for in the principles um, should be applicable to Article 79 of CISG. Um, and on what theoretical analysis you base your assertion? This is this will be the question, Pilar. Uh, thank you, um, Secretary General. I couldn't read that question because I had to go out and in uh, in order for the camera to work properly. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether I understood um, correctly the question. The question is, I think it's related with uh, the different solution found uh, within the CSG as compared with that of the, of the UNIDRA principle and whether that makes sense or not or what are the legal basis uh, for uh, coming to such a solution within the convention. Yes. Well, uh, if that's the case, uh, well, first of all, that is, um, I think uh, I can direct the, the uh, person that asked the question to the uh, whole, whole read, uh, full reading of opinion number 20, which is already on the database of the CSGAC Advisory Council, because this is much more comprehensive than the short answer that I can give now. Indeed, I don't like any fast and hard rule, meaning that you cannot have flexible uh, flexibility in order to accommodate the circumstances of the case to, to each situation. I think any contract, all the contracts are different uh, um, and, and therefore it's impossible to give a unique solution. So therefore that's why I ended my presentation saying that this is a very abstract uh, theoretical presentation. But then of course, when you come to the real problems, you have to see on a case by case basis a solution that is most feasible in accordance to the will of the parties. And as you mentioned before, also to the assignment of risk. In terms of um, the solution within the convention, let's say that the CRG advisory council has opted for one solution, which doesn't mean that that is the, all the possible solutions that might be found in the interpretation of the convention. This is a topic very controversial where almost all possible solutions might be found within um, other scholars, uh, scholarly opinions, as well as in case law. So therefore, 
uh, although the CSG is a, let's say, a qualified group in the sense that there are 15 scholars meeting together and stating the same kind of opinion, by no way uh, means to be the unique solution or the unique formula to be found in this uh, situation. Uh, from my perspective, though, it has the advantage of, first of all, um, considering a solution within the four corners of the convention itself, and therefore no need to resort to external principles, no need to resort to domestic law. This is um, in accordance with Article 7.1 and 7.2 of the convention, and therefore is, in, is, is coherent with the systematic of the interpretation of the convention itself. Uh, second, from my perspective as well, and in general terms, the solution to accommodate hardship situations within Article 79 is less intrusive with the principle of pacta sum servanda with the parties themselves and with the judicial and arbitral bodies. Third, from my perspective, again, it has the advantage of giving a uniform treatment to cases of forced major and hardship, especially considering that the same event can trigger to both situations. Therefore, to delineate a, a separation between force major and hardship might be very difficult in certain circumstances. In fact, the note prepared uh, recently by UNITRA precisely uh, touches uh, upon this, uh, this uh, area as well. It is true that the solutions are very strict, but still they are within the boundaries of the convention. And that is in a short uh, answer to the, to the question. Thank you. Thank you, Pilar. Okay, so there are, I'm going to read out three questions, uh, one for each, and uh, I'm going to read them all, and then I will give you the floor to finish because we need to finish that. Uh, so it should go quicker. Uh, one of them is for Professor Xi. Uh, what, in your opinion, are the innovative aspects of the contract law rules in China's civil code? And I would ask you, if that is the case, to please perhaps concentrate on uh, the matter that uh, we're concerned with. Um, another question for Pilar. Um, as a straight answer, I would think, can COVID-19 measures be considered as foreseeable in contracts included from now on? Mm -hmm. So they cannot be used as an excuse to perform. And uh, the third question for uh, Benedict. Uh, do you know if any country, the civil law of which has been influenced by France, um, after it has adopted the hardship doctrine um, after the reform, I would imagine. Right, so let's, let's, let's start with, uh, with uh, uh, Professor Xi, with Josie. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, briefly uh, stated, innovative provisions are uh, in uh, uh, China's civil code are roughly placed in uh, several groups. Let me uh, give you uh, four examples. First, some aim to generally bring the 1999 contract law up to date in light of the uh, developments in the theory and the practice of contract law, uh, particularly including uh, two new provisions on the formation and the performance of e -count, electronic contract. Uh, that's in Article 491, Paragraph 2, and Article uh, 512. Second, some provisions seek to strengthen uh, protections for weaker contract, contracting parties. For instance, a party asked to sign a contract with standard clauses can choose to void such clause that is adverse to her interests. If the party supplying the contract fails to notify her of or adequately explain to her that clause, that's uh, in Article 496, uh, uh, Paragraph 2. Third, because of the code uh, lacks a part on uh, generally on uh, obligations. So additional uh, general provisions on obligations are also added in subpart one, uh, the part on contract. Fourth, the new chapters are uh, added in subpart two to govern additional types of typical contracts. This particularly include uh, guarantee contracts, property uh, management services contract, uh, factoring contracts, and the partnership contracts, and so on. Uh, 
I hope this uh, part answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Josie. Uh, Pilar? Yeah. Um, uh, I think that the question is coming from our common colleague, uh, Professor Anselmo Martinez Canillas from University of Islas Baleares, because it's the only Anselmo that I know. So therefore, uh, <laughs> answering to our colleague, um, well, from now on, if the contract is concluded from now on, COVID cannot be considered as an excuse from, from performance, from, in my opinion. Uh, notwithstanding what I said, uh, you have to think that uh, you, it, it is the pandemic and well, as well as the systemic consequences that comes with the pandemia. So therefore it might be conceivable, maybe that some of the systematic effects, even though already the, uh, it is known that a pandemic exists, the systemic effects, wherever are uh, from now on, might be considered in the analysis. In any event, I will redirect uh, Anselmo to the note of the UNIDRA principles because there they have very, um, um, very useful scenarios, different scenarios, depending on the timing uh, of the contract conclusion as well as the legal measures adopted uh, within the countries that gives you a good overview of the temporal problems that arise from the pandemic. Thank you. Gracias, Pilar. Uh, Benedict, you have the floor and you close. Yes, thank you very much. Um, that is a very good question. And um, in fact, it um, enables me to say a little more about uh, France and the doctrine of imprevision. There was no provision in the civil code which prevented the judge from using the doctrine of imprevision. It's, it came from case law, which is quite unusual in France. A very important case said that at the end of the 19th century. And it only concerned private law. As regards public law, the doctrine does uh, play a role. So for other civil law countries, which were very much influenced by the French civil code, well, um, little by little, they abandoned the strict position that we had, and they introduced into their laws um, the possibility for a judge to revise a contract or to terminate it. And um, Germany has done so, um, and then it was codified. Um, I know that Belgium ha had not really done so a couple of years ago, but did so in relation to international contracts and UNIDRA principles and the CISG article. Um, well, so in fact, um, there is a reform now, which is pending in Belgium. And the idea is, um, of course, for the judge to be able um, to do so. I think that France was, um, in the world, one of the last countries not to have adopted this, uh, apart from the UK, uh, uh, of course. So, in fact, um, there won't be much influence from our reform, except that the way our new Article 1195 is drafted and the equilibrium it has reached may be of some interest for civil law countries who want to recodify their law of contracts. Thanks very much, Benedict. Well, thanks very much to all three panelists and to everyone that has contributed to the debate. Uh, this has been, at least from my point of view, a very exciting panel and uh, very good content. Uh, before we move on to close uh, the uh, workshop, uh, I'd like to give the floor to Secretary General Bernasconi. Christophe. Thank you very much indeed, Ignacio, and I do apologize for asking the floor at this late stage. Uh, but today is a significant day, not just because we had the privilege and the pleasure of actively participating in uh, today's uh, event and a heartfelt thank you and congratulations to all speakers for excellent presentations indeed. But today is also an important day uh, for the HCCH because it marks the official approval of the explanatory report on our newest uh, baby, the Judgments uh, Convention, at exactly 5 p.m. Central European Summer Time, plus probably one second, I guess, uh, the, uh, the explanatory report was uh, officially approved by the entire membership because we have not received a single 
um, uh, objection to uh, to that uh, explanatory report. So I do want to take the moment also to thank our wonderful co-rapporteurs, Paco Garcia Martin uh, from the Universitat Autonoma de Madrid and uh, Geneviève uh, Saumier from McGill University for their excellent job. This report will greatly, greatly help in the promotion, understanding and further application of the convention. I just wanted to share this with a group of interested international lawyers. Thank you very much indeed and thank you again for the wonderful event. Thank you very much, Christophe. This is great news to be shared live with you and, and with uh, our uh, friends, uh, uh, the entire team of, of the Hague Conference. And we could not agree with you anymore on the uh, uh, wonderfulness of uh, Paco and, and Genevieve, <laughs> whom we know very well. So congratulations. Um, Maria Chiara? Just to close up and thank all of you, I think it was an extremely interesting debate. It is a pity that uh, we didn't have more time because there are really a lot of questions and things that we could delve upon, which is always a very good sign. When you leave a conference with the feeling that you could have gone on and ask additional questions, so this means that the conference was or the workshop was extremely successful. It's uh, full of thought for the future. It shows that we do need cooperation and uh, we enrich our thinking if we keep on that way. And for sure, this is something that is of extreme use, uh, usefulness for uh, the market and commerce. So thanks a lot. Congratulations for all of you. And uh, of course, this is one of the many steps that we'll keep doing together. Thanks a lot and hope to see you very, very soon.